Hey, everybody. Um, welcome to Your Money, Your Life, Debt Collection in American Medicine with Luke and Masak. Um, just wanted to give thanks to a bunch of people who made this uh, event possible, the, the Law and Political Economy Project, um, the Program for the Humanities and Medicine, um, and our other co-sponsors who are the Department of Health Policy at the School of Public Health, the Program on the History of Science and Medicine, the National Clinician Scholars Program, the Collaboration for Regulatory Rigor, Integrity and Transparency, and the Global Health Justice Partnership. Um, I am just going to be your host and going to let our illustrious guests talk to you about their work, uh, both scholarly and activist. And let me just give you a quick introduction to who they are. Um, first, I'm just going to let the camera <laughs> point them out. This is Luke Messack. He's an attending physician at the Brigham Women's Hospital and an instructor of emergency medicine at the Harvard Medical School. He had a bachelor's from Harvard, which is important because that's where we studied, but it's also where we met when we were doing AIDS activism uh, in the early 2010s and protesting uh, the Obama administration's lack of support for global AIDS research. There's that. Um, he has he completed his residency training at um, Rhode Island Hospital, and his research focuses on the history and political economy of healthcare. His first book, No More to Spend, published in 2020, is a history of medical neglect in colonial and post-colonial Malawi, and his second book is the one we'll talk about today. Lindsay Muniak. It's about right. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Sure. Then tell me. It would be Muniak, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> uh, is an organizer of the Debt Collective, where she leads national efforts to fight predatory medical debt collection practices, addresses patterns of financialization in healthcare, and brings those who've experienced the failure of healthcare system into the fight for transformation. She's also a founding member of and co-chair of End Medical Debt Maryland, a statewide coalition of nearly 70 organizations that won a passage of the Maryland Medical Debt Protection Act written about by Luke and his book. And the Debt Collective, um, where she works, organizes debtors across the country to transform individual financial burdens into collective power in the fight for debt cancellation and universal public goods. And what we'll do is we'll let uh, these two uh, pose questions to each other for, for 45 minutes to an hour or so, and then we'll open it up to both people in the room here today and the 40 or so people who are on the webinar right now. And you can also put questions into the chat if they occur to you uh, as, as our speakers uh, start to speak with each other and discuss the important issues. Take it away. Yeah, all right. So this is, this is really the first conversation that Luke and I have had about this subject since his book was released last month. Um, and so I'm really excited about this. And I'm going to try to keep my enthusiasm in check in order not to <laughs> overrun all of our time constraints. Um, but yeah, I'm really, really thrilled. Thank you, Corinne and everyone at LPE and Greg who, who made this possible. Um, and so Luke, just to, to kind of get us started and as a framing question, I, I wanna ask about your, how you found this interest in the topic of the history of medical debt collection, because this is really the first book that's been written on this particular history. Um, your first book was on the history of medicine in Malawi, and you mentioned in this text that your interest in medical debt came from encountering the issue outside of the U.S. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious how you found your, your interest in medical debt in the U.S. from that position, um, and how it relates to your role as an emergency physician and your experiences with your previous hospital. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. Um, thank you so much for coming, guys. I know it's like a Wednesday night, um, like right after Thanksgiving, and uh, 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 in a room that no one can find. But like, thank you so much for, for coming. And I'm like surrounded by people who I've admired for for so long. There's like this there's this soliloquy in Henry V where he talks about um, being surrounded by he calls it a band of brothers, but like a band of brothers and sisters. Uh, and I feel like that now, you know, Rory, Kapsinski, Muniak, uh, Gettle, like. Reshma, like I just, people, uh, Greg, Lindsay, like people who I've admired for so long, and I'm so grateful to be here with you. And I think this question makes sense because uh, someone, so many of us here kind of straddle the worlds of like global and domestic health to the extent that those should be, ever be um, delineated from each other. Uh, but yeah, my first book was about Malawi, uh, where I did my PhD research in history. And that was about kind of the rhetoric of uh, neglect and how it, uh, comes to seem commonsensical to um, to exploit a people and uh, and uh, provide no health care. Um, 
And so it's largely a colonial history, but it extends into the post-colonial era. And while I was there, I started to think about what I would what I would do next. And I started actually reading some papers. One was written by a Yale med student like 10 years ago. And he had documented this idea of uh, medical detention, uh, this, this problem where in, in, in many countries around the world, uh, Southern Asia, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, there's, uh, there's a phenomenon whereby if you cannot pay your bill, oftentimes after a childbirth, um, particularly resonant because I had a baby recently. Uh, if you can't, if you can't, I didn't, but my, my, I, was, I was involved in the process. Um, the, if, you, if you can't pay your bill, then you are, uh, you're detained. And you are detained until someone in your family or community can, can bail you out. Uh, and uh, this was a problem that I thought, maybe I can write a global history of medical debt and debt and detention. Um, and so I, that was going to be, that was the grand vision for the next project. I'll be hopping around the globe, looking at all these folks who are held in Uganda and held in India and held in the Philippines. And then I was in residency at the time during the height of COVID with, with Cam. And um, uh, I started, this was actually right before COVID hit, um, that I realized that this problem was way closer to home than I was uh, ever going to be comfortable with. Um, I, I had started to hear about efforts to, uh, to stop aggressive debt collection measures in hospitals around this, the United States, particularly in Maryland, in, in Baltimore, because this was like when, when that was kicking off and are ongoing. And I, I just wanted to make sure my hospital wasn't doing this. You know, like, are we, are we garnishing people's wages? Are we denying care? Are we um, uh, putting people in jail? Are we putting liens on homes and foreclosing on their homes? Uh, boy, I sure hope not. And I bet we're not. You know, like this is a couple of bad apples in the sea of uh, American nonprofit hospitals. Uh, so I went down to my local courthouse, not someplace I'd frequented, but someplace, uh, the Kent County Courthouse, which was actually prettier than, than uh, many of the hospitals we work in. Um, uh, and I, I asked to be led to the, to, the, uh, to the court records. And there you can type in the name of any institution or individual you want. And I typed in my hospitals where I was working, and I found uh, that some of the cases were, you know, what I'd expect, malpractice cases, disputes with contractors, but some of the cases were the were, were what I what I feared. The plaintiff was the hospital, the defendant was an individual patient, oftentimes um, a single mom or someone living on social security disability income who was being sued for an ER visit oftentimes or some other bill for an inpatient hospitalization. And their their letters to the hospital were quite plaintive, you know, like I I Here's my situation. I really can't afford to pay this bill. Uh, and the, the extent of the lenience they could expect was to be put on a payment plan that had them paying back a single ER visit for five, six, seven years. Uh, and that was really something that, uh, that did shock me and, and filled me with some shame. Um, I should, probably should have known better uh, that this was going on and that it, it is a widespread practice. Um, much more than and a few bad apples, uh, but that that really got me going on this journey to think about how did we get here? Like, what is the history of medical debt collection in the United States? How did it go? How did we go from a si system in which uh, so many of us as physicians were personally involved in the collection of debts from our patients and having to have that deeply personal negotiation with them? Not a perfect world by any means, but a very different one from the one in which things have become so divorced and financialized that uh, physicians really can disclaim any responsibility or any knowledge of what's going on, even while their patient's debts are being bought and sold and they're being put in, put in court or in jail. Um, so that's, that's a long answer to your, to your question. Um, but a lot of that research brought me uh, to some level of hope when I found out that groups like the Debt Collective were uh, studying this really hard and also not just studying it, but doing something about it. Like they were the first ones to show that you could buy and forgive uh, medical debt, a practice that um, has been taken up by others in the interim, but was really super revolutionary when they first did it uh, uh, over a decade ago. And now they've, you know, I guess the question for you is, you, you know, the debt collective has gone from, uh, from that work with medical debt, you know, showing that these debts are being bought and sold on secondary markets 
and having a huge toll on patients as a result to uh, the student debt movement, which is, was uh, incredible, to all sorts of consumer debts that you guys are working on now, including medical debt. But I guess I'm curious about the debt collective's evolution and how you see that uh, the span of the, the debt collective's work and how you got, got to it as well. Yeah, um, and I just by by way of acknowledging uh, one of my own folks in the room, my my friend Margaret, who was able to come here from New York, and I first got involved with organizing around medical debt in Baltimore in relation to this big campaign against Johns Hopkins yeah. a few years ago. Yeah. I was really spearheaded by National Nurses United, yeah. um, and then SEIU as well, eleven ninety nine, and now Margaret is also working as a part-time organizer at the Deck Collective with me. So these things come, yeah, maybe it's just a room that's a full circle. It's a good room. Full, yeah, great vibes. Um, and I'm sure with folks online too. But I think, so I personally got involved um, with the question of medical debt explicitly that way. But I think like so many people who come into organizing around the healthcare system had these encounters with it in my own life um, and with, you know, in my, my father was terminally ill when I was in my early 20s and, um, and I was his primary caregiver. And so you encounter the healthcare system in these other ways and you encounter medical debt, you encounter collectors, billing threats um, coming in the mail. And I think for, interestingly, something that I've kind of reflected on is that when I first got involved with this medical <coughs> network, um, in Baltimore against Johns Hopkins Hospital, who you write about in, in this book, and who are still doing much of the same, although they've reined in the lawsuit practices a little bit for the time being. Um, I didn't I didn't necessarily think about medical debt as something that, you know, I have twenty four thousand dollars at that time in credit card debt from putting copays on credit cards mm -hmm. and taking out new lines of credit. Yeah. And medical debt as like a, you know, a standalone phrase was something that I was imagining was different and that was targeting, you know, certain neighborhoods in, in East Baltimore, in particular with, with Hopkins. Um, and so the, the process of also moving toward a more expansionist understanding of what medical debt is and how it appears um, is, is something that I think has really been helped along by my encounters with the Debt Collective. Um, and I, I first met a number of my now fellow organizers and comrades at the Deck Collective through this work in Maryland um, with this coalition that, that we built and that I now co-chart called End Medical Debt Maryland. Um, and we had been in touch with Astra and, and Thomas, for folks who are familiar with any of my colleagues. Um, and they had you know, a much more radical abolitionist vision of what um, you know, what debt cancellation could and should be. And of course, the, the Rolling Jubilee project that you're referring to, which really is, is the moment I think that the Debt Collective started to gain a lot of traction as a project and become visible, was, um, was created as an attempt to show the absurdity of being able to buy debt on the secondary market. Yeah for pennies on the dollar, not as a solution. And I think, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would encourage everyone to read Luke wrote a piece in, that appeared in Current Affairs last month, um, sort of looking at this phenomenon where this model of, of debt buys um, and, and cancellation ha is you kind of unpack why it has become a little bit complicated, a little bit fraught. I know I personally have um, a lot of a lot of concerns about the way that it becomes, I think because our healthcare system is so difficult to, to map, to navigate, this seems like one cool trick to fix yeah. the medical debt crisis. <laughs> yeah, <one cool> <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I think the initial idea um, and the idea that the Rolling Jubilee continues to adhere to is, is a radical one, is that yeah. you know it's, it's an agitation, what we would call in organizing an agitational tactic, mm -hmm. where you're showing people how grotesque something is, and by doing so, helping them kind of make sense of their own agency in relation to the political landscape. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, our our own strategy organizationally has evolved toward more more organizing work and other types of intervention. Yeah, oh, that's great. I mean, maybe this is a good time to to bring in 
where we are right now. <laughs> like, uh, we're in New Haven, and New Haven is like a whole chapter of the book, basically, because uh, this was really like Baltimore has its has its own sorted history with medical debt collection, but New Haven does too. Um, uh, but also a hopeful history uh, as well. Um, you know, one of the stories I start with in the book is the story of, uh, of, of Quentin White, who was a uh, who was in 1982, Quentin and Jeanette, his wife, were um, employees at a dry cleaning uh, institution in New Haven. And she, Jeanette, had to have two hospitalizations in one year. The debt from that hospitalization would continue to hound them for decades. Uh, in 1983, uh, the White family had a lien put on their home uh, and uh, they signed up for a, a payment plan. They initially owed about fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000. They signed up for a payment plan. They continued to pay it religiously, even on their, their limited incomes. Ten years later, they had not yet paid back the debt because they were owing 10% interest, uh, including and then late fees and uh, other charges. The, the, the debt had actually, had actually gotten bigger, even as they were repaying it. Uh, Jeanette died of cancer in 1993. They continued to pay the debt, or, or Quentin did, because of uh, something called the Doctrine of Necessaries, in which uh, it's a weird legal principle, like uh, hold over this anachronistic, anachronistic principle from the 17th century, whereby uh, spouses are held responsible for the debts of their widow, of their of their dead spouses. Um, and so he was held liable for that debt, and he continued to pay it. Uh, in 1996, his bank account was seized. And in 2002, he sat for an interview with the Wall Street Journal, who had heard about this practice because Paul Bass, uh, an institution in New Haven who uh, edited and wrote for the New Haven Advocate for many years, uh, had picked up on the practice and started to profile the stories of people who were being sued by the Young New Haven Hospital and other hospitals in the area. His stories got picked up by a young SEIU researcher uh, named Grace Rollins, who is now an acupuncturist in Pennsylvania, but who I talked to about this, and she was like 23, 24 at the time, did some amazing reports for the SEIU and uh, other local unions and local community groups, profiling more people who got sued, really getting into the forensics of how much money was being collected, what tactics were being used, who were these folks they were, in her telling, mostly low-income folks. And, uh, and then her work, caught the attention of the Wall Street Journal, who said Lagnado, who wrote a series of um, exposés on this practice centering on Young and Haven. Uh, and <coughs> that Quentin story became kind of a cause celebre. Uh, he, in the story, mentioned that he always wanted to go to Paris, but never thought he'd be able to afford it. So uh, after the story was published, Air France, like I said, they could pay for tickets to go to France. And uh, Yale New Haven eventually um, forgave the remainder of his debt, but um, continued to say it would take people to court. That led the SCIU and other local groups to um, mount massive campaigns against uh, the hospital uh, to get them to end the practice. Uh, they put up a, the SCIU put up a sign on I-95 that read shame. Uh, and I don't know if any of you were around for this, but I, I tried to find a picture of that, but I couldn't. Um, uh, but it ended up leading to changes in state law. It ended up leading uh, Congress to hold hearings on this. Uh, I talked to the Republican congressman who was incensed by these stories and held a series of hearings. Uh, he was the same congressman who held hearings about, uh, James Greenwood was his name. He held hearings about Enron and Martha Stewart, and he was about to retire, and he said, this will be my last hearing because this is, in his telling, like he, he said, I believe in personal responsibility, but this is asking people to be more responsible than they can ever be expected to be. Um, so that's like the conservative take on this. Um, and so he, you know, this this was really like a, an epicenter of uh, of the, the practices that I wrote about in the book, but also the organizing that made a huge difference. It led uh, hospital systems around the country to announce changes in practice. It led to new state laws. It did not solve the problem, <laughs> right? Even in Connecticut, lawsuits continued to pace um, shortly after this uh, and, and even increased in pace, uh, according to an uh, article by Zach Cooper and some others. Um, uh, so it didn't solve the problem, but it did draw a ton of attention to it. So like this, this all that to say that New Haven is like, a, a really important part of the story um, for good and for ill. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, it's 
it's always interesting to encounter these histories and realize how many similar struggles play out and then how the circumstances also that are producing these struggles reproduce themselves. And, um, and I think one, one thing as I was reading this book that I was really struck by um, was the, the way that you would, you would talk about these gains, these, these sort of incremental wins, but not, which I don't mean disparagingly, these are huge wins and they, yeah. I know yeah. from experience that they take a tremendous amount of fight. Yeah. Um, but then people, attention gets directed elsewhere, legislators get tired of passing another medical debt bill. Yeah. And um, if you don't really cement uh, laws that, that can throw up some, some walls around how um, I mean, I, my focus has been on hospitals, but, yeah. but you also write extensively about debt collectors. Um, my focus has been on hospitals just because in Maryland, hospitals can't sell their debt, which mm -hmm. is a good thing. Yeah. Um, and they, they can just kind of find these loopholes, wiggle back in. It's something that we're seeing in Maryland right now is yeah. we, this legislative battle that, um, that we won with caveats a few years ago uh, did not manage to ban under 1K lawsuits, you write about this a little bit, yeah. um, which is what the bill had been attempting to do. Uh, I would love for it to go much bigger. I don't think medical debt lawsuits should be a thing, as I'm sure many people in this room agree. Um, but, but it did force, I think, because of additional attention on the hospital industry in the state, um, hospitals to sort of pause their lawsuit practices, is what we know from data scraping, looking at court records. Yeah. Um, but I know from a lot of organizing that we're doing in East Baltimore and South Baltimore that people are still being squeezed in collections, you know, just as hard. And if people don't know that they're unlikely to be sued, well, attention is on the hospitals, yeah. which is, you know, there's so many asterisks even to just say, like, you're unlikely to be sued right now. It can still be used as a, as a cudgel to force them to pay up or take out a new line of credit. And so I guess one, one of the things that I'm, I'm curious about as you've looked at these histories and seen the ways that, you know, we had these huge, you know, this big fight and these wins in relation to Yale New Haven Hospital, but then they're continuing to yeah. squeeze patients for money that they don't have. Yeah. Um, how do you think about what, what needs to happen to intervene in a, yeah. in a bigger way, in awesome. a way that can be sustained? I was gonna have the same question for you. I mean, uh, I'm sure we both yeah. I mean, I was struck when I was reading about this. There were a couple legal scholars who did amazing work on this and continue to do it. But um, two of them, uh, um, one of whom will be familiar to almost everyone, uh, Melissa Jacoby at UNC and Elizabeth Warren, uh, now the senator from Massachusetts, but then at Harvard Law School, uh, they were writing a lot about medical debt and medical bankruptcies in the late '90s, early 2000s. And one of the papers they wrote was called Beyond the Hospital Misbehavior Model. And they were asking us to do something that I still think we have a lot of trouble doing, which is look beyond individual bad actors and in like hospital C-suites as the culprits of this problem. And they pointed out of many things. One is that, uh, that hospitals have an, uh, some 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 statutes within Medicare are seemed very complex at the time and seemed to require some measure of aggressive debt collection. That was actually answered by like um, actually the Bush administration in a series of uh, uh, memos um, by the Health and Human Services Department that tried to say that was no longer the case. Uh, but they also pointed to a number of other things like hospitals have an, an obligation to try to keep their doors open. Um, that the, the amount of debt that uh, hospitals collect through aggressive debt collection practices is not great. It's never going to help a hospital stay afloat, but in some C-suite eyes, like it seems like a necessary measure to uh, to do this. Um, but there are also other incentives, right? Like the 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 hospitals' own billing and collections departments are not built to collect debts from self-pay patients or the, the a euphemism used often for uninsured patients. They, you know, I talked to some people in debt and in, in the hospital billing and collections departments, and they mentioned like their role as they see it is to fight insurance companies. They want to extract as much as they can from insurance companies who's, who sees it as their job to pay as little as possible. So it's like a, this constant tussle with insurance companies. So in that role, I, I think I probably side with hospitals more often than the insurance companies, but like the, 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 the job of calling up the uninsured patient and telling them that they have this 
thousands of dollars to pay on their bill or else is not something that a lot of hospital um, billing and collections folks wanted to do. So they were approached beginning in the 90s and 2000s in, large, um, in larger and larger numbers by debt collectors who promised them to take this burden off of their plates. We are the ones who make those phone calls. That's our, uh, that's our bailiwick, that's what we do. We can prompt, you, know, you, can, you can send us, assign us this debt on a contingency basis, wherein you will uh, assign us the debt for a period of time, maybe a year, we'll work it, we'll collect as much as we can, and we'll keep a commission. At that time, at that point, it was like as much as 40%. It's gone down over the years, now it's closer to 10. Um, but you know, you got you guys will get this money. You don't have to pay us if we don't collect. Or you can just sell it to us outright. And so beginning in the 2000s, uh, more and more hospital systems, uh, large for-profit medical systems, but even non-for-profit systems, were saying, we'll sell this debt outright. Pennies on the dollar, right? Not a lot of money. It's oftentimes six cents on the dollar, or even less if the debt hadn't worked already. Um, you, you guys remember that story? Uh, I don't know if you guys watched last week tonight with John Oliver, but he, he did a story on debt buyers in 2016, which for me was a, a moment of revelation, um, where he bought debt through REP Medical Debt, this group that found its origins in the debt collective um, before splitting off. But they, he bought medical debt from uh, debtors in Texas and showed that you could buy and forgive it to a lot of large audience on television. Uh, he bought $15 million in medical debt in what he promised would be the largest TV giveaway of all time. Uh, does anyone know the second largest TV giveaway of all time or the largest at that point? It's Oprah. Would yeah, say. yeah, yeah, Oprah. You get a car, you get a car, right? Like yeah. that was, I've seen varied estimates about how much that actually cost. But it was like Pontiac G6 sedans for like 200 people or 250 people. It was like a, a few million dollars, but this $15 million one promised to be more. But how much did they actually pay for that debt? Any guesses? $700. Seven hundred dollars. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Seventy thousand. My God, that's really close. Yeah, sixty thousand. Yeah. Are you just gonna peace out with that? Nice little mic on. Yeah, it's sixty thousand dollars for fifteen million dollars in debt, like a half penny on the dollar. So, like, not a lot of money to be made. But back to the sorry, that's a uh, long digression. But back to the. Um, uh, Warren Jacoby paper, like they were showing that there, there were all these incentives and all these kind of path of least resistance uh, pushes and pulls to, to lead hospitals down this path and to just wag your finger at individual hospital executives and say, you know, naughty, naughty you, naughty, naughty you, like that was never going to be the answer. And we've, we've seen this even in the last few years, like if you want to get your debt forgiven, like having it written about by the New York Times is like a great way for you individually to have your debt <laughs> written off immediately. But it's not going to necessarily solve the problem, even if it gets that hospital system, it won't get the state, it won't get the country. Um, and, you know, we still have hundreds of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars in medical debt held by 100 million people in the United States. So um, I really do think that that. Um, that that is like a powerful, um, a powerful insight that we have to look beyond, you know, individual uh, individual actors. But I guess this question, like, so so, what does that mean for what we can do? Like these changes in state law are really powerful. I have been uh, heartened by some of the work being done by individuals in this space. You know, like there's there are private initiatives going on, which I think do. Um, agitate in a way that I think is helpful. One of the ones I write, I write about the debt collective, I write about RIP medical debt, I write about the, the, the um, tussle between them a bit. But uh, one more is, is this group called Dollar Four, which was started by, um, it was started by a former bartender in Vancouver, Washington, named Jared Walker, who ha was having problems with medical debt in his own family. And he realized that a lot of the problem that he was encountering was with even applying for hospital financial assistance. Every hospital since the ACA has to, every nonprofit hospital that gets a tax exemption needs to have a, a financial assistance policy, which should state at what level of income you receive free and discounted care. But they tend to hide those applications yeah. <laughs> as, as well as they can on their websites below like six links in which they tell you to pay. Um, and even when you get to the application, they can be very onerous, you know, income statements, tax statements, 
What GoFundMe accounts do you have going for this? Um, all sorts of stuff. And for people who are just recovering from illnesses or not even recovered, this can be a bridge too far and they end up in collections. And so he started this group that promises to help people apply for financial assistance for free. They don't take any money, they just help you apply. And they've helped to not only do that, but like point out how crazy the system is, how onerous it is, and how much can and should be done to make this easier. There's even hospitals like OHSU in Portland, Oregon, that now just screen patients at the point of care. And there's some state laws that are, like in Maryland does a bit of this, Minnesota just passed a law, a little bit of this. Yeah, there, there's still way more that can be done, but you can, you, there's, a, there's ways to know very quickly whether a patient will qualify without making them go through the rigmarole of applying. Right, so there's there's steps that can be taken on the public policy level that have been pointed out by these private actors, which I think is really powerful. Um, ultimately, like uh, I mean, this is maybe early to get to like the single payer as an answer part of the discussion, but like, <laughs> but, but like, but it is like I mean, I mean, as, as long as you're still trying to forgive medical debt or avoid, or, you know, avoid collections, like, but the flow of debt keeps happening, like you're still you're still fighting an uphill battle. It's still it's still a Sisyphean task. And so like cutting off the flow of medical debt through first dollar coverage that's free at the point of care, you know, that, that's like, that's the answer. Like Beveridge knew that in 1942, we should know it today. So, you know, that's, that's, my, that's my ultimate North Star, um, but, but there are these like smaller initiatives uh, as we move towards that. I, I, I mean, I'm curious about, your, like you talk a lot about incentives and like what we can do to change that incentive structure for hospitals. Like, what do you think we can, push on what levers are available to us. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, first of all, you know, as I'm, I'm sure it will be unsurprising to most folks here, I, I also think single payer is, is you know, the horizon here. And um, I was talking recently to a, a friend and, and writer who, who you may know, Tim, Tim Faust, who was saying, you know, like, <laughs> this is so absurd. There's all this talk about how we're going to, to solve medical debt as though it's not a feature of a profit-driven healthcare system, a necessary feature, um, actually, because of this coercive element that it, that it adds. I mean, how can you have a profit-driven, like, set of, of like forces of capital yeah. without debt? And, yeah. and you can't in a way. And so I think, and and for for me in this position of of like leading a you know a, a left organization like or I'll try to choose a diplomatic, like, um, but a pretty like radical organization's project on medical debt is that I end up in a lot of spaces with people who have the similar, you know, like, how do we address like medical debt and, and can't see, can't make that connection for any number of reasons. I mean, we're, we're indoctrinated in a certain way by the structure of our healthcare system to, to, um, to, to find it very difficult to imagine a different one. And I think what I've tried to, what I've tried to say to explain to these folks how the debt collective, how we understand the question of medical debt is like we're organizing around medical debt, not because we think that we'll be able to kind of like solve medical debt by solving medical debt or through these, you know, technocratic fixes, um, but because medical debt is the most concrete way that the failures of our current healthcare system appear in people's lives, right? You can hold yeah. a bill yeah. in your hand uh, in a way that, that literalizes these like massive capital networks that are very difficult for most people to map, uh, to map sorry, yeah. us included, I'm sure. It, yeah. it's, it, it becomes really hard to make sense of. And medical debt is, is sort of the literal form that that takes in people's lives, which makes it a great, a great <coughs> lens through which to help people kind of reclaim some sense of agency, like build some, some idea of collectivity around debt resistance, debt abolition, which you know I, I'm happy to get into later, but I'm going to try to stay on track now and, um, and really learn about our political economic system that we find ourselves in, which I think is pretty critical to the, to the task of, of like fighting for a different one. Um, and I think there's, with, with organizing work too, there's a sort of balance, especially when what we're doing in some sense is, is like class based organizing, right? It's just that we're not, we're not calling it that. Um, we're, we're saying, do you have debt? Like then, then you're part of this fight, mm -hmm. you know, come and, and rather than navigating this really individualizing, um, for a lot of people, very, very shame inducing because they've 
been taught their whole lives that to have debt is to to be um, immoral and yeah. come come into this space with everyone else who's in the same situation. Yeah. Um, we can talk about why this isn't a personal failure. This isn't an individual moral failure, but a real, but a structural failure yeah. of of this massive system that has plenty of money. And I think this what, what you were just saying too about the the question of of bad actors um, presents a really interesting challenge for organizing because you know. I was just sort of disparaging technocratic tweaks. I think these these technocratic tweaks can improve a lot of people's lives and yeah. in, in small ways. Um, but we're not going to tweak our way to yeah. <laughs> single payer. Not going to uh, nudge our way out of this one. No, it would it would be great. But yeah. um, but the the question of of organizing requires us also to think about like different different points of leverage, different pressure points. And sometimes those do involve identifying bad actors. And I think that the challenge, the challenge is not to locate that that bad action in the form of an individual hospital or certainly not an individual executive. I mean, I think this was we, we are doing medical debt work in Pittsburgh um, with partners at SEIU and HCPA. And I think one of the one of the challenges that came out of a big fight a few years ago in Pittsburgh um, against UPMC, which is, I don't know how many folks here are from Western Pennsylvania or have read Gabe Winans' excellent book on this, but UPMC is an economic behemoth. I mean, it really is like like hospital system, health system as, as yeah. capital machine. It's, it's, it's the largest employer in the state, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 By the largest private employer. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, and they're, you know, they are, I mean, they're they're just they're constantly expanding, expanding internationally, buying up local hospital systems, terrible to their workers, union busting. I mean, I could I could go on and on, but I but I won't because I'm gonna stay focused on the 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 main point. But they had, I think, successfully gotten a lot of people in Pittsburgh to sort of attach UPMC to its previous CEO, mm -hmm. um, and he became sort of like a figure, a, mm -hmm. a very. Um, loathed figure throughout the city and the region mm -hmm. but then what happens when in 2021 he retires yeah. and you have a new ceo who's stepping into the same role it's yeah. the same system yeah. everything's functioning the same you know i mean it's like how you're talking about these individual billing department staffers who do end up doing collections i mean for the most part it's not people who are like i you know just get a kick out of uh out of like squeezing people for yeah. money they don't have yeah. um and so I think like moralizing narratives that like locate those those people uh, as as like the enemy risk undermining like the bigger organizing project. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they can also be you know as I think especially looking at hospital targets yeah. as, as, and case studies and building targets, which is something that we do yeah. around particular hospitals that highlight their you know the gap between what they're actually spending on patient financial assistance, sometimes called charity care or community benefits and the amount that they're receiving in tax exemptions, which in theory should kind of offset each other, but very rarely does. Um, that, I mean, there's, there's, these are really useful campaigns to run, but even there, there's, there's always this risk of not getting caught in these narratives where you think, okay, well, if this, this hospital changes its practices, yeah. then problem is solved. Um, how do you balance this art in your yeah. book? But like, I'm always curious how you balance that like need for specificity with like the larger, the larger project or the mm -hmm. ultimate aim. Like, does does one necessarily follow from the other? Like, you move people to the specific, and then they like move toward the general and their imaginary. Or is, I don't I don't know how that organizing project. Yeah, I think it's. I mean, works. I think it's a, it's an ongoing challenge. Yeah. Um, and I I think one of the ways that that we have been able to do that successfully is bringing. People often they're the same people, but medical debtors into conversation with medical, you know, medical debtors who owe money to one system or within one state into conversation with medical debtors who owe money to a different system <laughs> in a different state. Um, but also in conversation with student debtors. I mean, you mentioned that the debt collector works yeah. on these different debt types. Um, yeah. Often these are the same, you know, medical debtors and student debtors. These aren't discrete categories yes. where you just pick pick your debt type. Um, there's there's a lot of. Can only have one. Yeah, yeah, just one. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Um, 
but but kind of helping people see the bigger picture and insisting on on this bigger picture. I think they're you know I mean it's it's a big challenge I think, for the the left in general is how to how to use these silos for their strengths in terms of like directing focus on a particular target or around a particular issue without falling into a trap where you have just totally you know you pretend that that like health justice and environmental justice are separate yeah. um when of course you know they're i mean like we have a lot of people in this room who are working across these different areas in, in interesting ways but yeah yeah um I don't know, should we throw it open for questions and then and keep chatting that way? Yeah. I, don't know, I feel like we should we have so many like awesome I'll go look at the chat you folks in the room. Yeah. I don't know. We can we can keep talking to each other too, but like I know it feels a little like selfish though. Yeah. I would love to I know. <laughs> I know. I just I just feel like there's so such good ideas in the room. I just want to make sure. So if you're online, put some stuff in the chat, we'll weed it out. Otherwise we can start over there. Hi, um, <clears throat> maybe I'm just gonna ask you to talk about something you've already raised because it's so obvious. Um, but when it comes to actual organizing, right, like the coalition in Maryland, how do you, how do you organize around the fact that one debt is never all it is, right? That like you have credit card debt, which was medical debt, you have overdraft because you had a copay, you have, you know, that all of these kind of debts pile up. Not only do people have discrete kinds of debt, but those debts emerge from each other. How in practice do you organize around debt in general without falling into that mistake of saying, oh, it's only, it's only medical debt. Like, what does that look like in practice? That's a, I mean, that's a great question. And for the, the Maryland Coalition, the focus really is on medical debt. And okay. so it's been less of a problem to navigate collectively. But for, I mean, for, for our medical debt work in Maryland as the debt collective, we are trying to straddle these different types. And we're people who have medical debt that they're struggling with, where we can help them apply for financial assistance. Um, you know, I mean, this is also one of, one of the sort of challenges of organizing is balancing meeting people's immediate needs with like the the need to bring them into a collective formation in order to act, like actually be able to exercise any power in a in in a serious way um but i think the you know i wish i could say that we have like a perfect system for doing it the truth is that um you know we're we're not like a super well-resourced massive organization with like teams of lawyers who are waiting to work with different people um, and I think at the level of, of like direct support, it's a lot of just being like, okay, I'm going to try to figure this person has credit card debt and is getting a call from the credit card debt collector. I'm not, I don't know a ton about the laws there, how they can navigate this, but I'm going to spend a bunch of time on the internet searching around and trying to help them. But of course that, that's not sustainable. And so I think what, what we're, what we're building in in Baltimore, I think will be the first place where we're able to do them effectively is um, like train the trainer programs where you can do you can train community members in some of these these parts of town where we're focusing our organizing efforts um, on how to navigate different types of debt. And there are, you know, there's a decent amount of crossover um, in terms of certain certain protections that exist for people and of course plenty of places where that doesn't exist um but if if folks have a baseline knowledge of i mean one of the one of the things that seems so basic if you've been working on the question of debt for a while but you realize that a lot of people most people aren't aware of is if you have a debt collector who's calling you at your place of employment you can tell them to stop and they legally have to stop um and so but but almost no one knows this, you know, least of all the people who are who are in the most precarious uh, employment situations, who are often afraid that when they start getting those calls at work, it might jeopardize their employment. That, you know, there are all these different ways that that coercion appears. Um, and so even just letting people know that is like a huge, like that. That's a. I mean, it's it's a it's an act of solidarity. Like you know, you could call it an act of of service, although we prefer to think about it in terms of solidarity, but. That's this this train the trainer model where we're kind of not not thinking about who can share this knowledge in a really again not thinking about it in an individualizing way where it relies on me or another debt collective organizer stepping in, but where people feel equipped to help others in their communities um, and also bring them into a kind of collective formation by like you know sharing some of the analysis. That's that's sort of where 
where where we're moving. But it's there's no you know organizing is hard, and and so it's it's a less elegant answer than I would have loved to give you. It's very helpful. Thank you, Amy. And then Marsha. Um, thank you guys both. Um, so I was thinking as you were talking about the, what I know about student debt organizing, which has been obviously incredibly powerful and um, has had many, many successes and, and where, you know, where there are similarities, you know, or might, we might build something more like the student debt work in the medical debt landscape. And I guess two things strike me in thinking about student debt. I'm sure I'm not, not nearly as well informed as you are um, about it, but one is that I think organizers have been successful at reframing student debt broadly from this, you know, you're an individual who got a benefit from the school and now you're deadbeat because you're not paying it back to like, there was a generational shift that young people now are being exploited in ways that previous generations were not, that there were all these things that happened that kind of tell a story about why this is not your fault. No, and a lot of that has to do with something very specific, a history of debt, right? And the history of the end of public education and um, you know, uh, for rise of for-profit schools and all these kinds of things. The other thing that seems to me really important um, and coming from the LPE project, you know, Luke Kareen's work and, and not only Luke, but you know, then the work of all the organizers and other thinkers and theorizers who said, hey, let's figure out a way, you know, it's kind of like one cool trick <laughs> to cancel debt, um, you know, because the debt's held by the federal government, a lot of student debt is, they could, and, and there was a legal sort of mechanism to allow billions of dollars of debt forgiveness all at once. And that's a very powerful organizing tool. Right. Yes. And, and when you're talking, Annie, about, you know, you might owe this to the credit card company, or you might owe this to the you know, the be lean on your house. And they, like, so there's both the dispersed experience of debt and then the conceptual problem. And then there's the actual just organizing. Like, it'd be great if we all had a common target. It'd be yeah. great if we had had, had, a set, had a similar set of moves that a large number of us could do together. That is easier than build single payer healthcare, right? right? And, but that is a good step because it builds the collective and it builds, builds uh, it, it, it builds in relief for people. So like, are there similar, how do you think about, uh, you know, both from what you learned in your, in your book, writing your book, Luke, and also what you think about as, as an organizer, Lindsay, like yeah. what are the conceptual moves that people need to, to, to make in order to get from like, there's a few people who are really harmed to like the debt itself is unjust. Yeah. And are there big moves that could be made that would kind of, kind of collectivize the advocacy um, uh, in, in, in a sort of similar way to the student debt? Yeah, I mean, this is a great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you Sure, yeah, and I'll, I'll pass it to you. Yeah. But I think, I mean, yes, you, you've raised so many excellent points. I mean, I think first, just to start with one, I, the big challenge in mapping the various strategies and tactics that have, have been successful in relation to student debt onto medical debt, at least in a perfect way. There's so much that, that we're, so many lessons and, and so much knowledge that we are able to bring. And I don't want to downplay that, but is the fact that with student debt, you have a, a single creditor, or at least if you're looking at public student loans and that yeah. when you're talking yeah. about targets, leverage, that makes an enormous difference yeah. um, because having all of, with medical debt, you have all of these dispersed creditors that are in some cases shifting when hospitals are selling their debts. You have, I mean, it's, there's collections data is, is virtually like non-existent. And so that's part of why we have to go into communities and talk with, you know, which isn't a bad thing, um, to talk with people, just to even sort of map the, the landscape. Um, but I think, I mean, I know actually, I don't know if some folks from the, uh, like the legal Yale Law Clinic on medical debt are here, or any student clinicians here, maybe not. It's, uh, yeah, but I, I know that there's a law clinic that's exploring some of these, you know, potential legal avenues, like the one that, that Luke identified, Luke Green, not um, not this <laughs> Luke. Um, and and I think that there's a fundamental difference when you're thinking about like the the kind of like one cool trick to you know to, to bring people in to agitate between a strategy like that that uses the law to you know to to the advantage of, of debtors as opposed to the way that it's typically used um, that sort of turns turns the law on its head in this way um, and and through doing so forces the cancellation of debt versus like the, the debt buy model, which I think the, the problem, once you reach a certain point with it is that you're, you're actually 
reimbursing these um, these forces that don't need to be reimbursed. And and you know, in the case of hospitals, settlements, your these are often hospitals that are sending um, that are sending folks to collections, knowing full well that they're entitled to financial assistance, and you're you're you know giving them what they would receive on the market for that, basically. So it's a very, I think the, the legal strategy is one of the areas that's really, really promising. But, um, but the fact that there are different creditors makes it trickier to think about collectivizing in relation to like a particular target, um, which is why we, we have these like local organizing campaigns that we've been building in Baltimore, in Pittsburgh, yeah. in rural South Central Pennsylvania, then in LA County to try to think about local targets mm -hmm. Um, and then what we're, and I, I should explain that, you know, like I have been working on medical debt for a few years. I came on at the Debt Collective about a year and a half ago to start building out our medical debt work. And so a lot of this stuff is still in, in the early stages. Um, but I think what we're trying to move toward is something like the student death fight, where we're able to shift consciousness in a way that also kind of like bolsters an organizing campaign um, and brings new strategies, legal tactics into light. Uh, but that's, I, I want to hear your thoughts too, Luke. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, that, that I talk, when I'm talking with Astra Taylor, she makes that point about like single creditor versus like just thousands and thousands of creditors. Uh, and it's a good one. I, I did wonder though, like the more I look at it, like the actors do, people do act in concert. Like these institutions mm -hmm. don't act alone. Hospitals have the American Hospital Association. Yeah. Uh, the state hospital associations were very powerful. They played a role yeah. in watering down the Maryland bill. Like. That, you know, they, they're not acting alone. Uh, the Receivables Management Association, which is the renamed Debt Buyers Association after the <laughs> drubbing they took from uh, John Oliver and others. Uh, yeah, I know, it's like, you know, what, did Oliver, what did George Orwell say? Like, it's important to use language like this if you want to use words without calling up a mental image of what it actually is. So, like, that, that is, those, those organizations do have intensive lobbying efforts. Um, and some of the, there are some, like, there are some small, seemingly small tweaks that I think would make a big difference. One of them is, I have this paper coming out about, um, about the regulations that were put out after the Affordable Care Act um, was passed about uh, hospital financial assistance. And it states in that law, the 501R6 regulations state that a hospital has to, before it undertakes what are called extraordinary collection actions, which are like all the things that we're talking about, reporting uh, debt to a credit bureau, uh, taking a patient to court, uh, putting a body attachment on a patient, like a warrant for their arrest, like uh, denying them care. Before you do any of that stuff, you have to take make what are called reasonable efforts to determine whether that person qualifies for financial assistance. But the way that was defined in the in the after the public comment period, in which the debt collectors and the hospitals spoke in unison, was extremely anemic. The hospitals basically have to put out a sign somewhere that's supposed to be public. I remember at my hospital when I was training, it was like in this corner of the <laughs> lobby where you would only ever be if your loved one had just died and you needed some counseling, not the kind of person who would be in a position to read about their debt collection practices. Um, you're supposed to put out a sign and you're supposed to make some paperwork available and put it on your website. Hospitals do that and it's still incredibly onerous and difficult to find out how to apply for charity care and to do so. And there's so many tools now that make it so easy for hospitals to do this on their own. They can look in state databases and see who signed up for public assistance programs and qualify you at the point of care instead of making you run through this rigmarole. And so reasonable effort should be, in my opinion, way more than that. But the problem, I mean, and, and some of the, some of the um, uh, consumer advocacy groups and patient advocacy groups who wrote in during the public comment period made this point, but like they, they the, 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 the the agenda had been set by the IRS and Treasury such that like it, they weren't even going to entertain this idea. So I think if you rewrote those regulations to make reasonable efforts into a reasonable effort, then the flow of debt would be stopped, stanched. Like so many folks who are below those cutoffs, usually at least 200% of the federal poverty level, oftentimes as high as 600% of the federal poverty level, or sometimes as high as 600%, um, would never receive a bill. So like, you know, changing that little lever at the federal level, which isn't even like, a, not even legislation, like that would, that would make something of a difference. Um, you know, and there, there were efforts like even 20 years ago or so, like right after the, the Yale episode, where there were, there were class action lawsuits 
against hospitals. And this was an effort by Dickie Scruggs, who was this uh, uh, famed trial attorney who um, he, he got big settlements for asbestos victims and then was in part of the big tobacco lawsuits in the 90s. And then he, he took, then took on hospitals before he went to federal prison for bribing a judge. But he, he wanted to take on hospitals and he said they're not doing enough for, yeah. to, for charity care. And that proved unsuccessful because at that point there was no right to charity care. There was no right to financial assistance. That started to change with the ACA where hospitals have to have this policy. And so you could maybe can imagine more of that sort of work going on now. Um, I haven't seen too much afoot in that area and it's not my expertise, but like it does seem like there's more of a legal basis for that currently. But there are some like, there are some, I, I'm, I'm still gonna advocate for like the larger fixes, but like the larger solutions, but like there are some smaller efforts that don't just rely on trying to pick off individual actors one at a right. time because there's 6,000 debt collectors in the United States. There are 7,000 acute care hospitals in the United States. Like doing each one individually or even the 50 states and the ter territories is just gonna take forever. <laughs> and that's what they're counting on. It is, and, and I should I should clarify because I guess I haven't said it explicitly, but our, like, our main leverage for the medical debt work at this point is around financial assistance policies and community benefits. Mm -hmm. um, in, in relation to nonprofit hospital systems, uh, which, as, as Luke has explained, are required to, as a condition of their tax exemptions, to provide financial assistance to low income patients, do not do it. And even in places like Maryland, where we have really quite, you know, relative, in relative terms, the best in this country, yeah, essentially. Really yes. excellent yeah. protections. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, suffered a pretty severe injury a few weeks ago um, that had me in various emergency rooms and hospitals over, you know, over the last couple of weeks since. And I had to sign every single time I went to, to a hospital facility, I had to sign a consent form saying that I had received three forms, one of which was financial assistance policy. Every single time that I have had to initial this, that I have received next to all three forms, including the financial assistance policy, I've asked for a copy of the financial assistance policy. Um, and every single time they have directed me to a bullet point in a list of like 25 bullet points on the back of this form that says financial assistance may be available. That's, wow. that's you know, and, and, and I've gone around to different desks and asked, and, and I mean, it's something where, you know, when I ended up in the emergency, I'm, I'm sure that I, signed or my partner signed uh these these same forms yeah. but what is the if if they're telling me that i can't have a copy of this thing that i'm saying i have <laughs> not only received a copy of but that i've had it explained to me it actually says mm -hmm. i have i've received and had explained to me the following yes. three forms yeah. um if if i and i'm fighting for the, you know, <laughs> you know I'm, more than anybody yeah. right yeah like i'm the only person who's going to be going from desk to desk to desk yeah. in the hospital yeah. and being like where is a copy of this yeah. and i'm still like I, you know i had d dislocated and fractured my arm in a number of places i was in extraordinary pain like the 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 idea that i would be like well i'm not signing this consent form until <laughs> you can show me a copy you know yeah. or i'm just going to go some take my take my consumer dollars somewhere else right it's a, <laughs> it's a total fantasy um yeah. Yeah. and so i think thinking this is where in terms of building leverage that that goes you know the gestures i think to the to the problems with um with the broader structure of our healthcare system and can allow us to notch some <clears throat> wins and build some power that can hopefully lead to single payer. I don't think we get single payer by canvassing for Medicare for all. I've tried that, didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, I think we get there by by bringing people who have been really screwed by our healthcare system into the struggle. Yeah, um, I think there's power in demonstrating the outrage. Like yeah. the outrage is being done upon the patient. Like it's just, it, it really does unify people. Like this is not, this is this does cross right left divides in ways that are um, even for me somewhat yeah. unexpected. Um, and yeah, it's just so tangible and so monstrous to think that like for the crime of falling ill, you'll end up in court. Like it's, uh, and that's, that's a widely shared sentiment. Right. Well, because there's in some sense, I think our, our healthcare system has, has overplayed its hand, right? I mean, at this point, most of us have been through or have had a, someone very close to us who's been through an extraordinarily awful experience with our healthcare system in some form or another. And if you do that to enough people, eventually, even the folks who would, you know, maybe be on your side in theory are, you're going to lose them. And so now we just need to, what we're trying to figure out is how to harness that power. And, um, yeah. So we have some online questions and they go to one of them. Then I'm going to go here, here, and then here. 
So we have a question from Ben. What's your sense of what gets the media legislators and administrative agencies to pay attention to medical debt? Ben has two questions. Ben, you're only getting one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ben. What, what, what makes media and legislators pay attention? Yeah, um, and administrators. So they're all district, different actors, but like, I, I guess I'll make one quick point about media, which you probably have great insight into. But like the Paul, I told the Paul Bass story because um, that was a, he was writing for a local weekly, now defunct, right? Like they- Wait, they, Reborn. Reborn, thank yeah. you. Thank okay. you, thank you for correcting this. Uh, reborn. But, um, but for many, for many, in many neighborhoods, in many communities, in many cities, those kinds of papers no longer exist, unfortunately. Um, but it was that kind of coverage, like the, the story written for, um, for a local audience by a very, very knowledgeable local participant observer uh, was incredibly powerful, right? And that, you, and even in my case, when I, when I found out that my hospital was doing this, I wrote, uh, I, I didn't know what to do. I, I wasn't sure, I wasn't, um, I'd done organizing before, but I, I'm not Greg. Um, and so I, I didn't know quite what to do. I didn't think I could take all this time and like try to organize a community of like-minded residents and approach our administration and have them wait us out until I finished. Um, I just couldn't imagine going to the hospital while we were doing this. So I wrote an op-ed and the classic like liberal thing to do. And uh, I, I sent it to the New York Times, no response. Sent it to Wall Street Journal, no response. Sent it to the Washington Post, no response. I sent it to the Providence Journal, like my own unfortunately fading daily in our, in our area. They were not interested. Uh, it was only when I sent it to Uprise Rhode Island, a, a blog run by a local progressive muckraker who like most of the articles are by him going to community meetings and like writing about like um, health injustice, environmental injustice, like things that matter for real people in real places um, that I actually got a response. And he said, yeah, I'll run this. And I said, fantastic. I'll be the only one who reads this. <laughs> um, I was so wrong. I was uh, completely incorrect. Um, I, 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 the article published and that afternoon, I got a call from my program director telling me that I was in some hot water because she, not, not, she, she had gotten a call from like the, the C-suite of the hospital being like, who is this kid? What is he doing? Um, yeah, those Google alerts on. Yeah, yeah. probably, yeah. So, so like I would just put in a plug for like, lo like very hyper local media being a very powerful force in this. I mean, Paul Bass wrote those articles and within a few years you had congressional hearings where Tenet and HCA and all these huge hospital administrators were saying, oh, please forgive us, we'll change everything. Like that, we should, we should not give short shrift to those institutions and we should protect them at all costs. Um, so that's a little plug for local media. Yeah, so what happened? Did they change? Oh yeah, yeah, oh, no, sorry, that, that story, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, in brief, like they, 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 they initially said that I was um, incorrect, that they were not suing patients. Mm -hmm. Um, I showed them the court records and, uh, <laughs> and they'd sued someone like two weeks prior. Um, and they, uh, they said they weren't aware that their third party debt collector was doing this. Um, they should have, because you can, when you write the agreement, you can tell them what they're do, what to do and not do. And so it's not an excuse, but I actually do think the people I met with did not know. Um, and they ended up, uh, dismissing the remainder of the cases and severing the relationship with that debt collector. The people who are on seven year repayment plans remained on those plans, despite my protestations. Um, but all that to say that like individual efforts are like something, but like the, the, the collective efforts, Yale, New Haven, um, and Baltimore, like much more hopeful, I think, um, in terms of making things happen. But if not for that local, um, reporter, then, uh, Steve Alquist is his name, uh, then I wouldn't have had any leverage whatsoever. So let's go over here. Which one do you want to do? No, no, go ahead, Anna. I think actually just um, riffing off of what you were talking about, Luke, I think uh, in the introduction to your book, you talk about how what uh, sort of the moral valence you brought to this work, in part because as a physician, similarly to me and some of the other people here, it's kind of just the barbarism and the grotesque nature of being complicit in a system yeah. that drives profit off of human suffering. Yeah. And I think, Lindsay, and some of the work that you talk about with Debt Collective, it strikes me that so much of... Um, the action is predicated on those who have already suffered, mm. self-advocating, mm. even in the surprise um, uh, medical billing act, you know, even though there are all these like bureaucratic ways to kind of try to um, stop 
you know, these surprise billing efforts. Ultimately, if something happens and you get a bill from an out of network physician in an in network hospital, it is up to you as the patient to say, oh, this is not, this shouldn't be happening. And ultimately, like if you pay, you're not getting your money back. So I guess the question I have for both of you is, you know, where do healthcare professionals, certainly uh, National Nurses United in Maryland was part of this, SIE, SEIU to some extent, you know, in terms of the unionization efforts for sort of non-physician professionals have been involved, but where do physicians and other sort of advanced practice practitioners, uh, how can, should they be involved such that it's not the people who are receiving healthcare who are probably the most disempowered compared to insurance companies, you know, integrated healthcare networks, you know, certainly the AMA is not going to help in this effort. What? But I know. Yeah. I know. Um, no, I mean, but how, how do you sort of gain sort of that critical consciousness among medical professionals to be involved in this? Because I don't think any of us got into this to kind of make a quick buck out of right. people. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll, physicians are way behind the ball on this. Uh, in, in New Haven, uh, the SEIU um, uh, chapter that was organizing around this was organizing food service workers at the hospital, many of whom were being sued by the hospital for the debts. Uh, in Baltimore, nurses, National Nurses United, amazing organization, like basically wrote Bernie's uh, single payer bill. Um, they were the ones who were pushing uh, in large part to make this, to make Maryland change its state law. Physicians have been like absent in, in most of the stories that I'm talking about. I mean, I, I, Marty McCarry, who's has kind of become this um, mm -hmm. uh, interesting figure <laughs> in the COVID world, he did, okay, I learned something from him about this. Uh, he's, he's a COVID contrarian, so that's probably why I like a lot of the Snickers, but like he, he wrote this book called The Price We Pay before COVID. And a lot of it's kind of like your standard Republican fare about like, you know, price transparency, that kind of stuff. But he has two chapters in there about debt collection. And he's as, he's as incensed as anyone. Like he he went to uh, he went to was it New Mexico or Arizona Carlsbad Carlsbad yeah. Carlsbad you read it yeah Carlsbad and he talks about he talks about how like even when he walked into the courthouse to look up their court records like they were at first not very helpful and then when they found out what he was doing they're like oh you better look into this and they start handing him all the court records and they say like my my mom got sued my brother got sued like everyone's getting sued like He's so like, it's like finally yeah exactly yeah. like someone cares and like so so. All that say like and when he approached the doctors at the hospital uh they were they were furious too like it's it's something that rouses the conscience of like most everybody like 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 from from makari to like me i don't know what but like uh, you know it's it's gonna get it's gonna get a, a lot of us riled up as i imagine it does you too like it's it, i'm not super religious but like i do think that there's like something of the sacred in the bond between a patient and physician and nurse like that there's that that the uh, market fundamentalists like can't take from us like it just can't happen like they're, they're if 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 we become reduced to a uh, transaction then like i don't know what my my world what will come of my worldview but like i can't keep doing what i'm doing like it won't work um so that was like a real jolting thing for me to find out that like in some senses it had like i i, I was already living in that dystopia that i promised myself i'd never let it happen um and I think that I think that is a powerful thing. I don't know if it's enough to like get physicians to organize around this. I hope it is. Like, there's certainly groups of physicians who are doing work around it, like Physicians for National Health Program and um, other organizations that I think have taken this up. But but uh, we are, as physicians, we um, are way behind like our other colleagues in the hospital in making in doing anything concrete about this. Unfortunately, Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, it was great. One of the first comments you made like really struck me about how initially I think you thought that there was like these are some individual bad actors and I think about some of the media coverage that has a story around like sponsors and like what happened there and um, and UPMC and what happened there and it has distracted in many ways of this being a systemic problem and kind of the things that you found where they're acting kind of in tandem, acting very similarly, like hospital to hospital, the, you know, the behaviors or the agreements that they have with debt collectors or the lack of transparency around their costing between facility to facility that contributes to this. Yeah. And I'm trying to like, want to like ask about like kind of the theory of change of trying to highlight this as a systemic issue to kind of get that sort of, I think to what Amy is talking about, like you know, finding that sort of mechanism to get a change. And then the other question I have that's related to this is, you know, when I think about like hospital quality measures, right, there was initially like this bottom up approach for better or for worse of like hospitals kind of coming together and saying like, we're going to set like 
some principles together. Yeah. And we've seen this in a lot of spaces where, especially when there's like private actors where they do like an ESG, like, you know, ranking system or they set their own best principles. And I'm kind of curious, like, are you seeing that here too, where some hospitals that are maybe doing some things around medical debt are trying to lead the charge and saying like, let's get a group hospitals together. We'll become like the thinkers about being the good guys in the hospital world and set the standards across. And you know what, what that has been looking like, like is, is the American Hospital Association doing this? And like, are there alternatives to kind of like pushing back against this? Like, you know, the Lounge Institute and their hospital yeah, rankings. Of, like, gonna, gonna bring <laughs> we're all thinking of Lounge, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, I'm just trying to like, you know, think about like, you know, for the like the sort of campaign, like the first question about like how to make sure this is a systemic issue, because I think I think for a lot of us, we, we initially come about it with like these horrible stories yeah. of individual mm -hmm. places, like places we would never work, but then realizing, oh, it's actually our own institution yeah. right here. Um, but like, yeah, trying to kind of like, that and then also the issue around like the ESGing of um, this in some ways. Maybe I'll just for for anyone who isn't aware of the Lown Institute. I mean, I, you are so this doesn't answer bring anything new to, to the question that you've been asking. But um, the Lown Institute is a think tank that focuses on the hospital industry and research on the hospital industry, and they've developed um, what they call a fair an annual fair share spending report, uh, which you know the kind of language of fair share. Is, is used here in relation to hospitals paying or not paying um, the, the community benefits and financial assistance uh, benefits that they're supposed to be offering. And they, they rank hospitals by comparing the value of their tax exemptions against their claimed spending on community benefits and financial assistance. So highly recommend that anyone who doesn't know them, check them out. I think in terms of the, the question of whether the hospital association, for instance, would actually steer things in a certain direction. I mean, I, I, I have colleagues who I respect who are working at the federal level and who are thinking about ways to sort of um, coax various hospital um, you know, bodies and, and including the AHA toward a kind of voluntary financial assistance policy, um, I can't say that I have any faith that this is something that would actually benefit patients if the benefit to patients would jeopardize or, or pose potentially some threat to, to you know, any type of capital flow that comes through, through the hospital. Yeah. I mean, one thing, and I don't know, you know, I think when, when we're sitting in the Northeast, it's kind of easy to remember that like, uh, there's uh, almost a dozen states that haven't expanded Medicaid mm -hmm. still, and yeah. and the paper that came out a couple years ago in, in JAMA that showed uh, that the flow of medical debt was cut by half in states mm -hmm. that did expand Medicaid and remained constant in states that didn't. So like that's it. I mean, half of medical debt we can get rid of just by expanding Medicaid. Yeah. Like, and and the hospitals are on that side. Like you yeah, know, like that's the reimbursement. And yeah, the, the hospitals are like some of the biggest yeah. um, biggest advocates for this, including some hospitals who like really need the money to stay open. Um, and so, you know, that, you know, and, and those ballot measures in very deeply conservative states have passed um, pretty easily. So like we, sh you know, that, that, that should be a part of this story. I mean, we were like, there's always this, I didn't want to write a book that like did the whole health system. Like here's what's wrong with healthcare in America. <laughs> Why not? But like, I, I guess I was, I was, um, I was uh, inspired by like Victor, like trying to like take a, take a, a specific, very, um, but poorly understood aspect of our healthcare system, hepatitis C, like this amazing cure that we developed that like people can't get their hands on because it's so goddamn expensive. And like, how did that come to be? Um, that like, that, that model of like using a one, um, you know, one problem as a dipstick for a larger problem is, is powerful. But like, yeah, so medical debt inevitably opens up like a whole can of worms. And I think like the flow of medical debt um, is inevitably a problem that involves who's paying for the care and so long as we're like putting so much on the shoulders of um, uninsured patients when they don't need to be uninsured, that's a huge problem. Um, but there are like, there are other, like le one more lever too, is that like sometimes, um, sometimes if you can demonstrate as publicly as possible how futile some of the outrages are, then it might make a difference. Like the CFPB put out a report about how, uh, how, uh, reporting medical debt on collections uh, didn't really help determine someone's creditworthiness. If someone falls into debt because of medical debt, it doesn't necessarily mean they don't pay their other bills or they're unlikely to pay their other bills. It's very, it's a different kind of debt. Like, I, I don't know how much, like, someone like the Debt Collective <laughs> wants to, like, like, 
like siphon off medical debt as like the the blameless sort of debt, right? Like, yeah. but but it, but at least in terms of like telling whether someone will be able to pay back their other debts, it, it's not as predictive. So they were saying even for the people who like care about predictive ability of credit scores, it's not helpful. Very quickly thereafter, all three credit bureaus, credit agencies, came out and said we're not gonna, you know, we're gonna we're gonna cut down, we're gonna cut down on the number of uh, medical debts that appear on these credit reports, and there are efforts now to basically wipe it out. I don't know if that's going to happen, but like it has made a big difference. Very, many fewer medical debts are showing up on people credit reports, and that makes a difference for getting a job, getting refinance, getting a house, um, and so it's real. It makes it harder to study medical debt. To be honest, yeah. yes, the data. Yeah, the data is the limited data that, that does exist. Yeah, Karen. Thank you both for the work that you're doing. I wanted to ask you each to elaborate a little bit more about your thoughts about the. Uh, power and potential impact of unions. You, you've mentioned yeah. in Pittsburgh, here in New Haven, Maryland, I guess also about um, organizing and advocacy uh, potential impact. And what are your thoughts about, those are just three cities, three locations about uh, furthering our um, collaboration with unions across the country? And, are, are, and is there a potential downside to doing that too much? Yeah, I mean, I, I think labor, organized labor, is really critical in this fight. I mean, as you said, NNU in the fight for single payer, um, you know, even though I think we can assume that it has some some way to go, like NNU has been fundamental. Um, and I, I mean, SEIU 1199 especially has, has really been, oh no, <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> but, um, it's my union busting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but I think, I, I mean, the there are always, challenges in relation to unions because they're they're you know they they have set priorities and often very hierarchical structures that mean that decisions about particular campaigns and where you're directing labor energy um are, are being made from above and that it, you know there's like a kind of as happens and should happen with a bureaucracy like a sign-off process for committing to working on certain things so there can be challenges like that in relation to working with labor but i mean the fact is that you know, workers are, are medical debtors too. You noted with, with New Haven that that's the case. SEIU HCPA, they did a survey last year of unorganized workers in the UPMC system um, that informed a complaint that they filed with the DOJ earlier this year that found that of UPMC, work, unorganized UPMC workers, which is workers at every hospital that wasn't unionized when UPMC bought it up. So most of them, um, of, of those workers surveyed, I think 36% owe medical debt to their employer. Mm -hmm. And then once you control it for low wage workers, so workers making under $20 an hour is how they defined it, it's over 50% are in, in active medical debt to UPMC. And, you know, I mean, Gabe Winant writes about this, this company, this modern company town mm -hmm. um, model. And, and so I think bringing, you know, the, the question of, of leverage in relation to debt gets more complicated when you have creditors that don't necessarily need your money, which is the case with most of these hospitals, as Luke writes about, you know, there it's it doesn't affect their bottom line um, withholding money, you know, and it can produce a lot of public pressure. Yeah. And I don't want to discount like that's been critical to the wins that we've notched, but but it shifts the leverage. With workers, they can withhold their labor. And if they're struggling with debt too, especially hospital service work. I mean, not to discount the important role I think that physicians have to play, but um, there's there's like a tremendous intervention that, that can be made in, in cooperation with unions. So I think, I mean, I've been doing as much as I possibly can to, to build our relationships with organized labor and the, the folks who we're working in partnership with at various unions have been. Yeah, and I will say, I think physicians are belatedly coming around to the um, realization that we are, not special. Like we, I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. uh, seventy-four percent of physicians work in large institutions. Uh, they work for they work for large hospital systems. They work for health insurers. They work for private equity. Um, we work for you know. So like, it, it, more and more like we are moving away from any like illusion that we are like hanging out a shingle on our own and doing our little home visits and like we're a private enterprise or independent professionals. Like the idea of the physician as an independent professional masters of our domain is like is 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 a faded you know faded um, idea that like really can't stand up to scrutiny any longer and so as a result uh, a lot of younger doctors have like fully realized that and are starting to organize and you've seen waves of uh, like um, elections to <coughs> unionize resident physicians uh, I, work at MG, hospital, yeah. I work at mgb and mass general brigham they, 
vote at 90 10. Like these are, these are landslide uh, unionization drives. And even some older physicians or like more senior physicians have unionized largely on the West Coast. But like, um, I do think that a lot of us are finally realizing like what, uh, what, what state we've gotten to and that like we have to work with larger organizations um, to push for change instead of imagining that it's all within our control. So we have a few minutes left. I wanted to see if you had some closing comments for everybody here and everybody online. There's a whole bunch of other questions we could ask and we could stay here for, for, for longer, <laughs> but we've been here close to 90 minutes. So yeah. um, would you want to give some closing comments and then we can um, wrap it up? <laughs> so <laughs> don't feel yeah, the hell. Yeah, I mean, I, first of all, thanks so much for coming. I'm really grateful. Um, and these questions were super helpful in thinking about um, what we can do. Uh, I, I do think like a plug for like one more plug for like history is that like this is a much longer story. Um, and I do think like understanding the ways that the way that um, people are paid for medical services, the way that hospitals have changed from almshouses into um, you know, really for profit institutions uh, is a huge part of the story. And by like plumbing the depths a little deeper in terms of like how have how have uh, debt collection practices changed from the 19th century to today, we can see kind of what we've lost, what we've gained, where we can go. Um, so I do think that history plays a big role in this. We, we touched on it a little bit, but I, I do think that like that longer durée can help us understand um, just how far we've come um, in good ways, good and bad. Uh, but but uh, I do think that uh, I'm super grateful that uh, Lindsay could come all the way from Baltimore because uh, the debt collective after after interviewing a bunch of people and reading every single thing I could get my hands on from a legal scholarship, from the finance scholarship, from a medical scholarship, from public health, uh, I have come to the conclusion that like the debt collective will save us. So <laughs> like, like no, no, not too much pressure, but I do think that their work is, is really hopeful, really creative, um, uh, really democratic, and uh, that that model um, arising from Occupy and that spirit, I think, um, gives us all uh, gives me a lot of hope and I'm, I'm really grateful that she could come and, and share share that vision too. I think I mean I think I think the collective will save us you know <laughs> broadly broadly speaking and any role that we can play in, in building that power is is a real honor. Um, yeah thank you all for coming and to everyone who joined online thank you too for for spending some time this evening I'm looking for where the camera is. <laughs> um, but and and thank you for yeah for this conversation i'm super excited to continue talking about this stuff as the night goes on but i i, I think just as closing thoughts i really want to encourage everyone to read luke's book for the reasons that, that he just named the understanding history is so critical to this work i mean in in relation to the kind of like transition of, of the role of the hospital the role of the physician um to what it whatever it's become, um, but also in relation to these struggles that, you know, that, that where my work takes place. I mean, I think if we, when we don't learn the history, we risk repeating the same patterns as I know from every time that I have picked up a book, including yours, and been like, oh God, <laughs> it's, this, it's the same thing playing out two decades later. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I, know a lot about medical debt as, as as things go and i learned a tremendous amount from the book so just want to want everyone to i'm sure you know i'm sure luke will give you a pdf copy if, if yeah. you can't pick up a, a you know a paper one but pick up a paper one if you can and um and thank you oh and one more thought um in relation to some of the questions that we've been like toying with here uh i think lp actually has a really great symposium on, like underway right now online on non-reformist reforms mm -hmm. and I think that Amna Akbar's piece which sort of launches the symposium and I haven't read the others yet but is a like offers some good context for for starting to think about um how to balance like these you know these spaces of struggle with like legal strategy policy strategy um you know it, it, not that it has to be a balance but how to kind of acknowledge that these things go together rather than fall into the trap of like reform versus revolution debate, which is yeah. not particularly useful. So I want to plug plug that as well and thank all of the folks, the LP folks who invited, invited Luke and I, and, and thank you, Greg, for 
wanted. So thank you everybody for being here. Thank you for being online. And with that, we call it a night.